Hey, what is up YouTube? Coles here. So by popular demand today, we have a special topic, which is a general drafting guide. So the way I'm going to approach this is going to go through five different sections, talk about the deck archetypes that you can try to draft in the arena, what the typical curve will look like in these decks, how you should be evaluating card in the draft to, and making these decisions of what to pick, some things you want to be thinking about after the draft, and some examples of decks that went pretty well in talking about you know how they relate to all these prior concepts and as always if you liked this video make sure to hit the like button if you dislike to dislike it comment if you have any questions or about anything else you want to see hit the subscribe button if you want to see more thanks for 3,000 subscribers recently by the way and without wasting any more time let's get into it so, all right first we're going to talk about the deck archetypes so before i get into the actual archetypes a few um, elements I want to address because these can exist between the various archetypes. So the concepts of basically proactive versus reactive decks. Some decks are going to be more proactive or reactive. They could be more aggressive or controlly. Some can be more combo oriented. Some can be more swing oriented. Combo just means, of course, that you're comboing cards together. Your standalone cards might not do as much. Generally speaking, this is less consistent in arena, but it can work, especially if you have a lot of interlacing synergies. And swings just mean, you know, you might accept being a little bit further behind, but then suddenly have a really strong turn and swing the board back in your favor and win that way. And again, that can also exist in faster or slower decks. And now that I'm through with that, the first archetype I'll talk about is aggro. So the thing that's interesting is in Arena, the typical aggro deck really doesn't actually exist, at least almost never. A true aggro deck is the type of deck that will, you know, be willing to just fireball the opponent in the face on turn four. Like, that's aggro, right? You'll be, you will do that with no hesitation. You really don't fight for board even. You just go face. Anything that you can stick on board goes face. Generally speaking, Arena is much more board focused and tempo oriented so these kind of decks don't tend to exist but sometimes once in a blue moon you might get a, a hunter deck especially with a bunch of spells that just actually wants to play this way so again you don't see these decks but it's important to be aware of the concept because sometimes in a game where you maybe you know the board didn't work out in the way you wanted sometimes other decks will resort to playing like an aggro deck to try to win against slower deck so the next archetype to be aware of is the tempo archetype this is the archetype that i tend to lean towards the most basically it's a somewhat lower curve strategy focused on just winning the board by all means necessary and and using that board presence to actually end the game that part is very important you will tend to in the early turns if necessary do a lot of trading just to make the strongest board possible and the most the board most resilient to possible swings from the opponent but again at some point you do generally have to go face and it's worth noting that there are a subsection of tempo decks that are more swing focused again if particular classes like if you're a warrior and you have a card like minefield or any class that has shavar when that card's in or just rogue in general has a lot of kind of tools to swing the board as well then you may have more swing focused tempo decks. The, the difference between these decks and a typical tempo deck is that they're going to have a bit more removal. So they're kind of expecting the opponent to try to take the board, but then punish them for doing so and then take an even stronger board essentially as a result after doing some kind of a swing play. The next arch archetype we're gonna talk about is control. I think most people know what control is. Basically it's a slower deck that tries to win the game with some kind of big win conditions. Now these can be kind of swing oriented using a bunch of like area of effect damage maybe or could be combo oriented not so much in arena typically in arena most control decks are really they just have a lot of big cards in them that just generate a lot of value and you kind of win the game that way in the event that you have a control deck versus either like an aggro or a tempo deck generally the control deck will be just trying to win through surviving and outvaluing the opponent where in like a control matchup, they could do the same thing or they could try to do something really strong and just create an unbeatable board that just wins the game that way. Now, one other archetype is the attrition archetype. Attrition is very similar to control. You can kind of think of it as reactive control. Essentially, it's basically a control deck that doesn't actually really have a win condition. Its entire win condition is just to stay alive and make the opponent either give up or fatigue basically. And you don't see these too much in arena because a lot of the tools that you need, especially these decks need a lot of taunt and healing and 
generally speaking, these kind of decks are going to go for a win condition, but occasionally you might have a priest deck, especially that just, you know, didn't really get a win condition, but can still win through attrition. And the last archetype I want to talk about is midrange. Midrange is essentially everything in the middle of control and aggro or tempo. Basically, these decks want to be as flexible as possible. And depending on the opponent, if they're against an aggro deck or a very aggressive tempo deck, they're going to be the control deck. If they're against a control deck, they're going to be an aggro deck. But the idea is against aggro, they'll just hold on for dear life and win by value. Against control, they're going to just ideally have a constant stream of threats that the control deck just isn't able to deal with efficiently and just eventually be able to overrun the control deck. I'll probably have a video sometime in the future where I go really far more into depth about kind of the win conditions of these different types of decks and how that relates to, you know, how you should be playing in the actual games. All right, so now that we're through with the deck archetypes, I'm going to talk about kind of what the typical curve will look. So for this, I'm basically talking about like a standard mid-range deck. That's kind of the normal deck in Arena. So the normal curve you're going to be looking at, you're going to be looking at something like 6-2 drops, 5-3 drops, 4-4 drops, 3-5 drops, a few like maybe 4 cards, 6 plus mana, and maybe like 2-1 drops. And so in general, when I say drops, I mean like this is a minion that you actually want to play on that turn. So if you have 1 mana, you can play like a 2-2 two -two or a 2-1 maybe. A 2 drop would be like a 3-2 or a 2-3, a 3 drop would be a 3-4 or a 4-3, you know, so on, so on. If there's a card that's somewhat situational, like, you know, something like Dark Iron Dwarf, like, you might be able to play it on 4, but you might not, you know, maybe you count as like a half. You know, these are just general guidelines. And it's worth noting that this varies a lot by meta, because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a very aggressive or tempo-oriented meta, and you might want even more 1 drops and 2 drops. Or some metas could be very control oriented where you don't need one drops, they don't do enough. Two drops, eh, don't really matter. You know, you just want to get a bunch of more big stuff. But generally speaking, it's going to be somewhat close to this, but you might be leaning kind of a little bit in one direction or the other. And when I say lean, like typically you don't want to go too crazy. I mean, if you're trying to build a true aggro deck, you could go really crazy and maybe some really wacky control attrition decks. You can go kind of crazy the, the other direction if you have a whole bunch of, you know, removal and AoE. You might be able to get away with a lot but generally speaking you're not gonna go too far in one direction like maybe you'll get like a couple extra two and three drops or a couple extra one drops you know to be a more aggressive deck and if you're a more a slower deck you might just pass on a couple of those early curve minions and get just get a couple extra big things because in a sense like most of the decks you're gonna draft in arena to get like consistent results are still gonna technically be kind of in the mid-range category it's just i do recommend that you go kind of a little bit into the either aggressive mid-range or the slower mid-range side just so your deck kind of has a bit more of direction i find that decks where you really try to go middle of the line just tend to not work that well but maybe that's just me and really a lot of how you do this really comes down to experience like again i have like these general guidelines but i don't there's really not like a super hard number of like exactly what we're going for here with experience you kind of get the sense of what you can get away with what your deck needs based off of what you have and all of these kind of things and so just for a couple of examples of how you might deviate, like say you're making your curve a little bit more aggressive by cutting your a couple four drops from the typical curve. Well, okay, you still want to think about like, what are you going to do on turn four? Maybe you have, because you lowered your curve, you have extra one and three drops. You, instead of playing a four, you can play a one and a three. That can work, right? Or say you're a control deck and you're actually cutting the four drops to go a little heavier. Well, maybe you have an extra two drop and you are playing a class like Mage with a good hero power and you can go two drop hero power and be pretty happy, right? These are the things you wanna be thinking about to make sure your deck still flows and actually works in a real game. And again, keep in mind that these are really general guidelines, especially recently since Blizzard started printing cards like Venomous Scorpid, for example which, you know, basically gives you a card, a generated spell, discovered spell, which is, you know, amazing value potentially at essentially no cost because it's an almost playable minion without the discover. You can basically make any deck better by just getting a bunch of cards like this. So the ideal deck really wouldn't have, even for control decks, wouldn't have a super high curve. You'd rather just have a whole bunch of venomous scorpids and stuff and then, you know, have an actual low curve. So 
That's why I say like this is like the typical curve. It's not actually even the ideal curve. It's just generally what you can expect to get. Now going back to my original curve that I had mentioned. So two one drops, six two drops, five three drops, etc. Et those were those were 24 cards that I mentioned. So the other six cards are essentially flex picks. These are your rooms for si more situational cards, removal, that kind of stuff. It's important to not really view these cards as the core of your deck, but they can be the icing that makes, you know, the cake that is your deck really work. What's really important to note with these is again like that's kind of like what I consider like the average. I tend to play very proactively. I like to have you know just be the person establishing the board and all this stuff. Generally speaking the faster deck you want it's very important to not have too many of these reactive cards because you know you're gonna have opponents that just don't really do anything and if they're sitting there not doing anything eventually they're gonna be able to play all their big expensive cards and you won't be able to compete with them so you need to be doing something. If you have too many reactive cards you just can't do anything and then you know you're just going to watch yourself lose. But then if you have a slower deck you know if you really think you can compete in the late game then you can get away with having a whole bunch of reactive cards and if they don't do anything it's fine right you'll just win later. But it's still pretty important to have some proactive cards generally unless you really super high roll because generally speaking you just can't get that many powerful reactive cards in arena just with the draft it just doesn't tend to happen that often so you generally are still going to at least to some extent play the board typical strategy and take advantage of those powerful reactive cards when you when the time is right and so there are some factors you want to be thinking about in the cards you're picking as both as far as your curve minions and also as far as these like situational flex picks you get. You want to be thinking about generally how much taunt you have, how much heal you have, what the general stat lines of your cards actually are, particularly like the core cards. Do you have discover? How much synergy based stuff do you have? Do you have area of effect damage? Do you have big removals, small removal, situational stuff? And so a lot of this is rather common sense. In a more aggressive leaning deck, you're generally going to care a lot more about, you know, getting minions with good stat lines, maybe having a little bit of discover and removal just to be able to, you know, answer certain types of situations you expect to see. But generally speaking, you know, you don't want too much of that. You just really want to be able to consistently output boards that can produce damage to be able to win the game. Now in a control deck you're going to want to draft a lot of cards that make it really difficult for your opponent to do that kind of stuff to you. So you're going to want a lot of as much taunt, healing, you know, a variety of removal between area of effect, big removal, small removal, just to be able to be flexible and handle any kind of situation. You know, a, mil a more middle of the road deck is kind of going to want to have a little bit of everything. And one thing that's actually really important to note is that the same cards and types of cards in different deck strategies can actually fulfill completely different roles. So for example, Taunt in an aggro deck, you think you don't need Taunt, but well, Taunt can be very useful in an aggro deck because even if that minion itself doesn't have the most aggressive stat line, it can protect your other minions that actually deal damage. Where you know in a control deck, the Taunt is really going to be the thing that keeps you alive. A really classic example from a couple years ago was Tar Creeper. People, you know, a lot of people incorrectly thought, oh, this is, you know, this is a minion that only has a lot of attack on your opponent's turn. Well, this must be crap and aggro, right? It's like, no, because, you know, you play a one and a two drop and then you play a Tar Creeper. And your opponent can't get past the Tar Creeper, the one and two drop keep dealing damage and then you, you, dev you dominate your opponent really early. Another examples with big minions. So big minions in aggro are, you know, you would consider them finishers. You hopefully by the time you're playing any big minion have already dealt a lot of damage to your opponent and that big minion maybe will just, that big sticky minion can just get one, that one last face hit to finish off your opponent or put them in critical damage to put them in range of, you know, whatever burn spell you happen to have. Where a big minion control deck has a very different role, it probably needs to just, you might be trading with it and, you know, being able to generate value just through killing a bunch of smaller minions that your more aggressive opponent might be playing. Or just in general, once you've run your opponent out of resources, just being that big thing that your opponent can't deal with, and then you just smack them in the face until they stop moving. And the last example I want to use is Discover. So Discover in aggro, again, will generally be used to find maybe a finisher or a win condition that you don't actually have in your deck. Power, a lot of the power of Discover is that you can have that kind of flexibility to only get that finisher if you need it, right? It allows you to keep your curve lower and you can potentially find like maybe a burn spell that just goes face that you didn't actually want to draft because, you know, it doesn't help you too much if 
you happen to draft a 5 damage burden spell and your opponent has more than 5 health. Well, you know, Discover and Control, on the other hand, is going to be much more likely used to find reactive options. Maybe that area of effect spell that you just didn't get offered in the draft, or maybe just some crazy late game that your opponent won't have any chance of being able to deal with. Alright, so now that we've talked about what you want your deck to actually look like as far as composition, what kind of cards you want to have, let's talk about how you should be evaluating cards in the draft and how you should be choosing cards to actually get you there. So the first and most obvious thing that you should be thinking about in choosing between three cards in the draft is which card is the best card. As of now and for the foreseeable future in the arena, cards that are offered are essentially completely random and they can be of completely different power levels. You can have the best and worst card in your class right next to each other. So the result of this is that you really don't want to be forcing any kind of like deck archetype too hard. You don't want to give up too much value just to get like, you know, a particular card that you happen to want, at least not if you're trying to win. Generally, if you do that, you're just going to end up with a much weaker deck and it's not going to work out very well for you. You should really let the draft guide you as far as what direction you're going to be going. So how do you actually determine which card is the best card, you might ask? So there are some tools available which I do tend to use. Ideally, you would, you know, just gain a whole bunch of experience and be able to evaluate these cards for yourself. But, you know, I'm a data guy myself as well. So even when I have a bunch of experience, I still like to look at data. So the number one resource I use is hsreplay.net. On HS Replay, you can go into the arena section and look at a whole bunch of data for these cards. The general stat that most people will look at the most is the deck win rate. This is the most relatively unbiased source of just, you know, how well a card decks containing any particular card are performing. If you look at the played win rate, that can tell you some things, but you have to be a lot more careful because certain types of cards like area of effect, for example, tend to do extremely poorly because you play them when you're behind, you know, so you have to be in cards like Pyroblast, you know, a finisher is going to do really well because you play it to literally win the game. So you have to be a little more careful with that stat. It's worth noting though that you can't always 100% just take the deck win rate and evaluate 100% based off of that because there are some kind of obvious and some less obvious data anomalies that you'll see in HS Replay. Just some classic examples is there are cards that are misplayed more often. So the average person on HS Replay is a better than average player. I think they're like a four, four and a win average player maybe. So they're not terrible, but you know, they're not playing optimally. So a classic example is Acidic Swamp Ooze. So people tend to not play Acidic Swamp Ooze when they're able to, and they should play it on curve. Just like, what if my opponent has a weapon? And you'll, you can see some examples. There was a recent example on Reddit where someone posted, and it was very clear that they lost the game because they didn't play it on turn two. All right, so cards like Acidic Swamp Ooze will actually underperform. And there are other cards, like another couple two drop examples, like Blood Sail Raider in a non weapon class, Sun Reaver Spy in a non secret class. These cards will actually tend to have to overperform in their stats because, not because these cards are good, but because, you know, a lesser player is less likely to pick them because they're like, oh, that, I don't have that synergy. This is not a good card. But really, you should just be looking at it as a two drop and, you know, Another topic is that just generally speaking, at least right now, this is a tempo meta we're in and better players tend to appreciate and pick more of the one and two drops. So these kind of cards generally overperform. Don't automatically think that just because a two drop has a higher win rate than some other, you know, mid or late game card, that's a better card. You might very well be able to replace that two, slightly better two drop even more easily. And it'll be more important to get, you know, a more powerful and unique card. And the other general thing to be aware of is, you know, synergy cards tend to overperform as well because, you know, it's kind of obvious that you pick a synergy card if you have the synergy. Don't automatically pick a synergy card because it's a high win rate if you don't have the synergy for it. If you do have the synergy for it, go by all means, but, you know, just be careful about that. So the other resources available, there is, um, there's one tier list still being maintained right now, which is the Hearth Arena tier list. Hearth Arena, there are a few good players that essentially they maintain this tier list. They rate all the cards against each other and, you know, give their opinion. And you can kind of reference this tier list as well. Grinning Goat as well tends to do a very thorough evaluation of cards that are coming in. They used to have their own tier list, but unfortunately they don't maintain it anymore. So especially if you might be playing right around a release, obviously there won't be much data on HS Replay, so you may have to go for these, you know, these kind of opinions. 
you know, at least myself personally, once there's data, I tend to trust the data a bit more because, you know, sometimes, you know, everyone gets things wrong. So sometimes you get some really glaring examples of just complete misevaluations by a large amount of the community. And so probably the most common question I get is what is the drafting tool I use in games? So I use this thing called Arena Tracker, which I will link probably in a pinned comment under this video. So what Arena Tracker does is it just shows the deck win rate from HS Replay along with the Hearth Arena score, basically showing you all the data that's available. Formerly they used to show the Grinning Goat tier list as well, but again, that doesn't exist anymore. And the basic functionality of, you know, just showing those scores is available on the free version of that app. There is a premium version, which I have because it was given to me. But the only thing I actually use on the premium version is the synergies that show up below the card ratings. There are a lot of other bells and whistles that are available on the premium version as well, but I don't personally use them. You can check out his website if you want to check all of that out. So generally speaking, like when you're doing a draft nowadays, because, you know, the cards are totally random and the power levels often, you know, very disparate between the cards, usually like at least like 15 or 20 picks of the draft should be pretty obvious. Honestly, that's why I tend to go through my drafts a lot pretty quick now. Back in when there were buckets and cards that were generally more comparable power level to each other existed I, I would take a lot longer in drafts but now i'm through most of my drafts in like five minutes but you will have maybe like you know maybe six to ten picks per draft that are going to be you know really close calls and you you're going to want to think about a little bit i will find that often there's going to be like one or two picks right around hopefully in the middle of the draft where you really kind of have to make a choice of really which direction you want to go you have like a really strong control card or a really strong you know tempo oriented card and you really have a a difficult choice to make and that's often like one or two picks per draft and these are the picks that I think are really critical and r can really make or break a draft so in the case of these close calls you're going to want to think about kind of what kind of deck archetype you might want to go but also just look at your deck and think about okay what kind of deck actually is this it's going to be very important to go for the direction that your deck is able to go based off what you already have in the deck and now I said you don't want to force decks, but you know, you should hopefully know based off of, you know, what the meta is, what class you're playing, you know, generally what kind of decks tend to work for the class you're playing and what tend to work with your play style. So you can kind of, in these kind of close calls, kind of nudge the deck in that direction potentially. And if there's a certain type that of card that you want to have for that play style and you don't have, and you know, one of these options is that type, then you may want to go for it. And then sometimes it will happen where you've thought about this and you still have a really tough choice. And then in that, in that kind of case, my tiebreaker is often going to be just whichever card shows up less in the draft. You know, if one card's like a common and one's an epic, you know, you're not likely to see that epic card again, so you might want to take it. Or just in general, not just the card, but if that type of effect is a little bit more difficult to get, you might take the, you know, the rarer effect as well. So generally speaking in the draft, you want to be tracking over time how your deck is progressing in various categories. You know, how your curve is doing based off of, you know, each of the individual curve slots, how many situational cards you have, make sure you don't have too many. Make sure you have a variety of removal if you desire to have such and all of these things. I don't tend to do it personally because I tend to be very fluid and you know when I have a hard pick I'll I'll make you know my evaluation at this time but common advice that I do here is to split the draft into segments so you know me might split it like every 10 picks or every or just cut the draft right in half where you know the first section you're going to be picking basically entirely by value just pick the best card no matter what and then as you move into the later sections you start to think more and more about you know exactly what your deck needs and you want to be filling in the gaps that you might have it is sometimes very important not to think about this too late because it can happen you know certain strategies like control for example really fails without certain enablers you know if you have a control deck that doesn't have any taunt or healing or doesn't have any as much removal or especially area of effect removal you know it's not it might not work out very well for you so especially in a slower kind of deck if you think that you really are going to need to have something you know the first type of any particular card you get you know the first area of effect the first hard removal you know that kind of thing you might want to prioritize prioritize just a little bit higher it's worth noting that how you are going to be actually tracking and evaluating this progression is going to be a bit meta dependent just this is and this is something that maybe isn't entirely clear to everyone that's 
different metas, you do get different things better. You know, in the current meta, for example, it's really hard to get taunt minions. So if you want to play a slower strategy, you may really have to value that taunt really highly. And again, like this is going to vary by class as well. For example, like Warlock right now has a lot of crazy spells. A lot of them happen to be area of effect damage. So, you know, if you're playing like, you know, major right now like major priest or something you might have to take any area of effect you get where you know warlock can kind of be picky because they get so many of them offered and especially if you want to be a more aggressive deck you really you might be you have to assume that you might be forced into more aoe than you want so you wouldn't want to take it too quickly if you know it's not a super premium aoe and one thing that's worth noting is I think especially for newer players, there is a tool that Hearth Arena has where they, they don't just show you the tier score. They actually essentially try to do this through their algorithm where it evaluates based off of their deck archetypes, which are very similar to the archetypes I mentioned in the beginning part of this video. And it actually will chain modify their scores based off of that, makes make cards potentially drastically higher or lower based off of what it thinks you need. And again, with any tool, you would you would want to take any rating that it has with a grain of salt because any algorithm like that, it just isn't going to do quite as well as, you know, an intelligent human being would. So as a guidance point or if you're newer, I think it could be really useful. At some point, you know, you do want to, as you get more experienced and skilled at Arena, you probably want to think a little bit more for yourself. And so the other thing I want to address is that, you know, generally speaking in Arena, which I think this is a bit different from how deck building works in Constructed, is that generally in Arena, a more flexible deck, you know, kind of within the confines of your deck archetype is going to have better and more consistent results than a less flexible deck. You know, in Constructed, where you get to choose all your cards, you can go for a much more refined win condition and make sure, you know, every card in your deck is really working towards that that one win condition. But, you know, sometimes in Arena, you just don't get exactly what you want and you, you need to be a little more flexible. And, you know, you want to be thinking about essentially how you beat a fast deck, how you beat a slow deck. Do you have the ability to be aggressive against a deck that's slower than you, or will you just out control them? Do you have the ability to be faster than a fast deck? Or if you go against a really crazy fast deck, are you gonna be able to just stay alive? And the last thing I wanna mention is that keeping that in mind is just generally the importance of having a coherent win condition for your deck. One thing that can happen, which may not be always your fault, but you know, something that can also happen more often if you're not keeping this stuff in mind, is that you might end up with a deck that essentially just doesn't work. You know, an example is like if you have a deck with a really low curve that has like a bunch of area of effect or just generally reactive cards, it just doesn't make sense. You know, you have like a really slow deck that doesn't have that area of effect, doesn't have any taunt or healing, so it just cannot win against anyone that just plays minions on curve and sometimes just the way a draft goes sometimes you can kind of see this happening in the middle of your draft and in a case of a deck that's like kind of failing you may want to go a little bit crazier than you normally would and generally speaking you want to be as consistent as possible but there are some times where you can be rewarded for going really crazy as an absolute last resort sometimes you can go like you know full aggro or full control which is uh, essentially you'd be saying like okay pick literally whatever the card with the lowest number is or the highest number you know to go for the you know desired direction based off of what you think you might be want to try to but I'd be cautious to really recommend doing this too often it's usually not correct and especially if you're you know inexperienced or easily tilted you know you might be doing this way too much and then you're gonna end up shooting yourself in the foot. Probably the more reasonable thing to do is just to favor, you know, maybe a couple extra, you know, combo oriented cards or just high risk, high reward cards. Like Enchanted Cauldron is a really good example, you know, a card that it can completely fail because it might just give you completely useless garbage, but it might also just give you exactly what you need and, you know, win you games by itself. And it's worth saying that some people will generally go for a little bit more of a riskier strategy in general. If you go for more risky strategies, like you tend to go 12 more often, but you also might go, you know, like zero to two wins more often, right? Some people, like me personally, I tend to be a bit more consistent. When I go 12, I don't go 12 oh as much. I tend to go like 12 and two, but I have a lot of runs that are, you know, somewhere in the middle. I tend to play a bit more risk averse, so I will very rarely go less than four. But again, also I won't go 12 as often as some people. Both of these, you know, the more middle of the road consistent strategy or the high low strategy, they could both be valid ways to actually get you to a very high average in arena. 
All right, so before I get into some examples, the last thing I want to talk about is essentially after the draft, how you want to be thinking about basically how the draft went and how that should be impacting how you actually play out in the games. So the first thing you'll be thinking about, hopefully, if not before, by the time you actually enter a game is how your deck should be impacting how you decide to keep cards in the mulligan. So I actually have already an entire guide video on exactly my thoughts on how you should be mulliganing. So I'll just direct you straight there for that. The second thing is that, you know, it should also be impacting how you actually play in the games. So it's important to think about after the draft and during the games exactly what the weak points of your draft were. For example, if you're a control deck, you didn't really get enough taunt or area of effect damage. Maybe you need to play extra aggressive defensively just to make sure that you don't fall too far behind because if you do, you won't be able to come back. If you're a tempo deck that really didn't get too much as far as a win condition against anyone that isn't also seemingly a super crazy aggro deck, you might need to play even more aggressively, just kind of disregard everything, dump everything, and just hope that they don't have the AoE because you probably won't be able to beat it anyway. I will most likely at some point have a future guide video to really go more in depth in this video, so I'll pretty much stop here. I think the one other thing I want to mention though really briefly is just that in any individual game, your deck may play like a completely different archetype just based off of the draw you get. Maybe you have a more aggressive deck, but you just happen to draw all of your big things. Maybe you might have to play that game more like a control deck. Or maybe, you know, you might have what you thought was a control deck and you just don't draw your biggest 10 cards. And I guess you're, you're stuck having to play like an aggro deck, right? So that can happen as well. All right, and let's get into some examples of some decks that I've played in the past relatively recently that worked out rather well. But before I do, one thing I want to mention is just that the, the decks that I actually show here are, to be honest, a little bit arbitrary, especially recently, at least as we're recording this video, the meta is such that the biggest RNG right now is who your opponent is in any given game. And sometimes, you know, you might see the best player in the world have an okay deck, but then just go 0-3 because they have three unwinnable games in a row. It doesn't, it does happen, not very often, but it does happen. And so there are plenty of decks that are probably just as good as the decks I'm about to show you that just, you know, they might have gone like four wins because they just went against three dirty high rollers somehow. So the reason I bring this up is that it will happen to you as it happens to everyone that you will have decks that just seem like amazing decks that just don't get the results you expect them to get really disappointing results. So it's really important, a huge skill in Arena is to make sure you don't let this get to you too much and try to correctly identify when it's actually you making a mistake and you need to change something or when, you know, you're just getting unlucky. But of course, it's safe to say that any deck that managed to go 12 wins, it must have worked to some extent, right? So I think these are good examples of kind of what these kind of deck archetypes could look like. And fortunately, as I have a video library here on YouTube, I can actually link you to these full runs if you want to check those out as well. So the first one I'll put up here is, as of posting this video, probably the most recent video I've actually put on the channel before this one, which is a 12 win Steambot Paladin. So this is essentially a more aggressive Paladin as Paladin, Paladin often is, at least as I tend to draft it, but more combo oriented as it had, you know, these cards, it had both a Steambot, but also a Swamp Dragon Egg that require activation, but fortunately it had you know, a bunch of these hand buffs or board buffs to actually activate these cards. And it's, I think, a really good example of just, you know, some of these unconventional cards. If you do have the right combo pieces, they can work out. The critical thing in that case is having enough combo pieces that these cards are unlikely to become a liability. But I'm still willing to say that it probably won't produce the most consistent results, so don't go picking up an empowered steam bot just because of this deck. But, you know, it can work. And the next deck I'll show you is this 12 win mage deck from a couple weeks ago. So this is more of a mid range type of deck and you can kind of see from the deck. This is I think a really good example because this is not a deck that had overwhelming card quality. The cards honestly are pretty mediocre, but it just had a little bit of everything. See, it has reach damage with the fireball, AOE with the fire sail and the flame ward with the Kona cold as well. Hard removal with the two Tarajo Braves and also kind of the claw machine for sustain as well as the Primoil Protector. It really, this deck really just has a little bit of everything. And it also has a solid curve as well to be the foundation, you know, just to be able to tempo out against a lot of opponents. 
and a critical piece as well being those two pander and importers to generate the spells that you might happen to need in any given game especially if they happen to be puzzle boxes so again i think this is just a really good example of you know a really flexible mid-range deck that just does whatever it needs to some games it was the aggro deck some games it was the hyper control deck sometimes it would be a combo deck if it discovered you know grand finale or whatever right it really it was had a little bit of everything and the last deck i want to show you is a control example this is a 12 win shaman deck from about a month ago this is a deck where you can see really it doesn't have nearly as much curve as i suggest you have but you know it has a whole bunch of other things so it makes up for all this by having a whole bunch of removal. It has the two lightning storms, it has a coaster, the earthquake, derailed coaster to clean up little things if those AoEs weren't enough, the big game hunter to deal with some one big thing, potentially able to discover a hex from something like Venomous Scorpid as well, some taunt and healing to stabilize with the cartridge defender, and a couple crazy late game win conditions with the tiny toys if you're lucky, but bit more consistent value with the primordial protector and the fog shaper this unlike a little bit more than the others i think it's fair to say was a bit of a high roll deck you kind of have to high roll with shaman most of the time to be able to get a control deck to work you know this was one of the rare decks from what i remember i think this deck went against ysera two games in a row and it actually did beat one of them so that's how you know it's a good deck so I hope that gives kind of an idea of like what these kind of different archetypes tend to look like. Of course, I have many more videos where, you know, a whole bunch more examples you guys can look at. I tend to post in the video description kind of what I think the win condition of the deck is. I've been starting to do, you know, video and intros for these videos as well where I talk about it as well. Of course, if you come to a video where it's not clear, you can always ask me. I will probably see a comment and I can respond and, you know, if you have any questions about the deck as well. Which is a good time to say as well, if you have any comments, you can also leave them in the comment section of this video. If you have any feedback about this style of video or any other videos you want to see. Of course, if, as always, if you like the video, like it. If you dislike it, dislike it. And hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. And with that, I appreciate you all hanging out to the end if you actually made it this far. So thanks a lot for that. That makes you awesome. So thanks and we will see you in the next one.